the 1920s will always be associated with jazz. The decade would be unrecognizable without it. But why was it so important? Why had it become popular? Let's find out. Jazz began to develop largely in black communities in the South, particularly New Orleans, around the 1890s and the turn of the century. But before jazz, there was blues. Blues music was derived from slave songs sung in the fields, expressing their woes, hardships, and religious beliefs. This can be traced back all the way to Africa, where the slaves originally came from. Singing about their problems and complaints made it easier for them to get through the workday. It is unanimously agreed that jazz began in New Orleans. New Orleans was the perfect place for jazz to begin. It had many blacks and whites as well as the unique class of Creoles. Creoles were part black and part white, descended in part from the white French men who used to live in the city. Creoles had a higher social status than blacks, but a lower one than whites. They generally chose to associate more with their white heritage, and that included their musical tastes. They learned primarily classical music, and importantly, they could read, write, and transcribe music. When some joined the emerging world of jazz, they added an important contribution. Black musicians, and a few whites, provided the main body of creativity and innovation, while Creole musicians were able to write down their works, as well as that of their fellow black musicians, and create sheet music. The most important of these Creoles was Jelly Roll Morton who is credited with having published the first jazz song in the form of sheet music. The blues scale was quickly developed for use in jazz, but jazz added different elements. At this time, the blues was generally only sung. Musicians, especially trumpet players, began playing the vocal melodies of the blues on their instruments with additional flourishes. Piano players were more influenced by ragtime music a jaunty, upbeat form of piano playing made famous by musicians such as Scott Joplin. Ragtime was replaced by the stride piano style by the 1920s. Stride piano is characterized by the wide back and forth movement of the left hand, which keeps the rhythm. These two main components combined, and bands playing a strange new form of music began to appear. The unique feature of jazz, however, was not meant to be written down. Improvisation was, and still is, a central component of jazz. This means that when a player plays their solo, they think of it as they go along, using a basic scale but adding flourishes and techniques to spice it up. This also made it possible to have late night contests where two players take turns trying to best one another at an improvised solo. This was most common among stride piano players, but could also be between two cornet or trumpet players. These were called cutting contests. Black jazz musicians, especially cornet players, got a lot of exposure playing on riverboats around New Orleans in the late 1910s and early 1920s. There, they would play the new style of hot jazz with the band, which many of the white patrons found exotic and irresistible. Dancing almost always followed on these riverboats. The cornet, and later the trumpet, was perhaps the first important solo instrument in jazz and many of the most famous players got their start on riverboats, including Louis Armstrong. Jazz as a whole was great and everything, but who were the main players? One of the most important early musicians was W.C. Handy. He was an important figure in blues compositions, which heavily influenced the jazz musicians of the 1920s. His St. Louis Blues, written in 1914, was one of the most popular and influential songs, and it has become a staple of the jazz songbook. Joe King Oliver was another important figure. He was instrumental in combining blues with jazz and wrote a number of early jazz standards, such as West End Blues. He also pioneered the use of the trumpet mute, one of the most fundamental techniques used in jazz. For those that might not know, slowly removing the mute as you blow into the trumpet makes the wah-wah sound. King Oliver's other important accomplishment was helping Louis Armstrong rocket to fame after he featured him prominently in his band as the primary soloist. Louis Armstrong himself was perhaps the most influential of all 1920s jazz musicians. His blistering solos and innovative use of his cornet and trumpet set the standard for all jazz trumpeters after him, 
He is also credited with pioneering vocal improvisation, or scatting, which is a technique that doesn't use words, but rather random sounds, with an improvised rhythm and melody. There are countless others. Other famous players worthy of mention are Buddy Bolden, Bix Beiderbecke, Sidney Bechet, and Fletcher Henderson. There were also countless musicians who got their start in the latter half of the 1920s, such as Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, and Gene Krupa. Once more white musicians began to enter the world of jazz, the music began to seep into the mainstream society of young people. Young people's newfound emphasis on fun and excitement made jazz a great outlet. Numerous dance crazes swept across America throughout the 1920s, thanks in large part to jazz. Dance bands seemed to pop up every second, and their demand was high for social functions. Many also had to cater to certain white patrons at parties by playing nicer, softer dance music instead of the crazy hot jazz many of them loved to play. Many black jazz bands became house bands at clubs. The classiest clubs were practically always whites only, despite having a black band provide the entertainment. The best bands, such as Duke Ellington's Jungle Band at the Cotton Club, played in a way that only good black bands could play at that point. Even though this fact was largely recognized, Whites in the 1920s rarely, if ever, considered such playing an art form. And black musicians were still not allowed into all of the fanciest clubs as patrons. But blacks had their own clubs in the predominantly black neighborhoods of the cities, which were generally considered dirty and lowbrow by most whites. The most important area for jazz and black culture in the 1920s was the Harlem neighborhood in New York City. The late 1920s saw the emergence of the Harlem Renaissance, a period where black culture flourished in America. Some important jazz techniques were pioneered and rapidly developed in the 1920s. I've already mentioned some of these earlier, like stride piano, muted cornets and trumpets, and scatting. The 1920s also saw the early development of swing music, which was developed in large part by Fletcher Henderson, who had one of the hottest bands in the early and mid-1920s. Swing music would later take America by storm in the next decade. While many cultural aspects of the 1920s vanished after the Great Depression took hold, jazz continued on. Even though the music industry struggled throughout the 1930s, jazz reached new heights, and some of the best jazz standards were written then. In this way, the legacy of the Roaring Twenties was able to survive. I hope you enjoyed this video. I have many ideas for future videos, but if there's something you'd like me to cover, please let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching all you chics and gals out there, and stay tuned for more tales of the jazz age.